Uh, hi, this is David, and this will be part 10 of Basics of Game Theory. And today we're going to continue off where we left off on part 9. We're creating an early position opening range for a full ring no limit hold'em that will be unexploitable by an aggressive 3 better who has position on us. Okay, uh, that's what our primary concern is, and we looked a little bit of last time. The situation we have here, it's a 2-5 no limit holding game, full ring. You have effective stacks of $500. The small blind is lim has, has posted $2, big blind has posted $2, and we are raising it up to $20. This creates a, a pot size of $27. Now, our big concern right here is that we ha might have an aggressive 3-better uh, after us. We're not concerned with the possibility of running into very strong hands like pocket aces, kings, queens, because those only occur a small fraction of the time, we'll get those hands just as frequently as he will. He won't be able to exploit us that way. In fact, if he only raises with those hands, he won't be stopping us frequently enough to uh, stop us from pursuing our strategy. Uh, what we would like to do is we would like to play pots in position, hopefully against uh, one, you know one player or so where we have a uh, good opportunity with our position and initiative to take down the pot. When we're raising with our very poor hands, we're happy just to pick up the blinds. Uh, but anyway, what do we do to prevent him from just coming in with any two cards and blowing us off our hand? Well, uh, let's look at what happens. Uh, we've raised to 20, and let's say he, the three better, uh, is going to raise it up to $60. Okay? Uh, we put it in down here. Uh, he's raised to $60. When he's bet $60 to win this $27 pot, he's laying 2.22 to 1. When he lays 2.22 to 1, his break-even threshold is 69% folds. Okay? So, that means that when he bets this $60, he needs us to fold 69% of the time in order to make an auto profit by bluffing with any two cards. This, of course, means that we will have to continue uh, with at least 31% of our opening range. 31% of all the hands that we open with will have to be able to stand up to this 3-bet. So what we're going to do is construct a range that consists of one-third very strong hands, about 33%. And the other two-thirds hands will be various different hands. But uh, in this way, we don't really have to worry about this player. Okay, If we want to play aggressively like this and come after these other players, uh, we can't get into a, uh, an ego contest with the, with the aggressive 3-better. If he comes and bets his, raises up to $60, we just have to quickly let this hand go. And we can do that even though we know that he's going to be bluffing a very large fraction of the time. Uh, we can do that uh, because if he's betting $60 to win this 27 we shouldn't have to even worry about him stealing our 20 Even if he feel, steals our $20 two-thirds of the time, one-third of the time, he's going to have a nasty surprise and be running into a very strong hand because we're going to construct our range that has one-third very strong hands. Now, before we go on, I want to explain a little bit about the, the combinations in Hold'em in case there's anyone here that doesn't know. Uh, the total number of uh, combinations in Hold'em. The way we figure this, first we'll look at our nine pairs. Uh, there are 13 denominations of cards and each one can be matched up with 12 different denominations other than its own, other than, than a pair. So the total number of combinations we're going to get, we have 13 denominations multiplied by the other 12 denominations, and each one of these has four different suits, so another 4 times 4. This comes out to a total of 2,496, and that is the total number of permutations. The permutations uh, has to do with the order of the cards within combinations. Now, because we're not concerned with permutations in Hold'em, uh, if we're dealt King-Ace, that's just as good as if we get dealt Ace-King. They're the same thing. So we can divide this number in two. There are only half as many combinations as permutations. We have 1,248 com combinations of non-paired hands. Uh, with our pocket pairs, 13 denominations each have six different uh, combinations of pocket pairs. And in case you don't know what those are, here they are right here. Diamonds, clubs, hearts, clubs, hearts, diamonds, etc. So we have 78 total combinations of pocket pairs. 
When we add the 1248 to the 78, we come up with 1,326 total combinations of Hold'em hands. Now, we said that one-third of our uh, total range is going to consist of very strong hands. Here we see the, right here, the premium hand combinations, pocket aces, six combinations, uh, kings, queens, and then ace-king is non-pair, so it has 16 combinations. When we total these up, we have 34 combinations of premium hands. If we divide 34 by 1,326, we see that that's a, a distribution of 2.6% of the total distribution of hold'em hands. Now, if this is to comprise one-third of our opening range, then our total range will be 2.6 times 3. Okay, we'll be opening up with 7.8% of the total hands that were dealt. Now, if we look at poker stove and filter for the top 7.8% of hold'em hands, we come up with this distribution right here, and these are the hands that we see highlighted in purple. Okay, uh, these include pocket eights are better, ace king, ace queen, the suited aces down to ace ten, uh, you know, suited kings down to king ten suited, queen jack suited. Uh, these are this is the these are the premium hands if we look at about an eight percent range. Now, if you were a player who were to never open limp and you were going to only open raise or fold this would not be a bad group of hands to use okay uh, because they're the best of the group but I think you would be shortchanging yourself in live games or on low limit games because there are lots of weak players in those games who you would like to play post flop with uh, so you would be shortchanging yourself if you only came in with this group of hands therefore what we're going to do is if we're someone who also likes to open limp sometimes, we're going to mix this up a little bit. We're not going to come up in with the top 7.8% of the hands. We're going to come up with the premium hands, and then we're going to choose our bluff raises out of those hands that we would normally fold. Okay? That we're getting value out of hands that we would not play otherwise. And these second tier hands, these medium strength hands, we will take out of our opening range. And if you don't understand why we should not have these medium strength hands in our opening range, I advise you to look at videos number six and seven again. And there we explain the benefits of having a polarized range. Uh, we're trying to protect ourselves from the aggressive three better. When he starts betting at us, coming at us, and a lot of money starts coming into the pot, we're going to be in very bad shape if we have hands like these, pocket eights, pocket nines, pocket tens. Uh, king jack suited, king queen suited. Those are pretty decent hands, and we would like to see a flop with them against these weak players. And he's forcing us to fold them. These hands are not good enough to call out of position against a three bet, and they're not good to, good enough to shove in with. So, if we uh, come in with a raise and get raised off of them, we've really given up a lot of value. So, if we're going to open limp with some hands, we should use these knee strength hands, these pocket pairs, and some of these suited broadways and we should choose a different group of hands that we're going to use for our bluff raises. And those we're going to use, the ones that are almost good enough to come in, but not quite. And I'm going to show you the different candidates that we have that are almost good enough. And those are going to be things like our suited aces, our offsuit broadways, our smaller pocket pairs, our suited connectors, and suited one gaps. And those are all hands that are almost good enough, but not quite and in the next video, I'm going to go over each of that group and explain why I think some of them are better than others as far as using for our bluff raises. But anyway, uh, we're just about at 10 minutes right now, so we'll go ahead and stop this, and video 11 will continue right where we're stopping.